Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Doug Blonsky, President and CEO of the Central Park Conservancy, an organization whose mission is to restore, manage, and enhance Central Park for the enjoyment of us all. In partnership with the public, the Conservancy raises 75% of the annual budget for the park. And Doug has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Doug, for joining oh, us Oh, it's great today. to be here with you, Mark. Who doesn't love Central Park? Who doesn't love the fresh air? Who doesn't love the magnificent trees? And who doesn't love the ability to come in as New Yorkers and as visitors to New York and just experience the park? Talk about the genesis of the, of the Conservancy in 1980 and, and how that organization has, has ensured that that park remains a vital force in the city itself. You know, and I think it's, it's interesting you that you just say that who doesn't love Central Park? And in 1980, there was a lot of people that didn't love Central Park. Um, when New York hit the fiscal crisis of the 70s, right. Central Park by 1975 was probably at its worst condition that the park has ever been in 150 years. It was a dangerous place to visit. The lights were out. The, the Every light was broken in the right. park. Crime was at an all-time high. Uh, it's amazing just to think about it. Back in 1980, we had almost 1,000 major crimes in Central Park. Last year, 2014, there were 85 and half of those were unattended properties. So people just put their bag down, felt so comfortable, and they walked away. And, and this is a park that has seen an increase from 12 million visitors a year back in the 80s to over 40 now, 40 million. So you see it's a direct correlation of you, you make it better, you bring good use in, population rises, and crime goes down. But, but the genesis of the Conservancy was in the 1975 and the late 70s, the park was so bad, you know, New Yorkers were starting to get really angry that how could we let New York's greatest asset, and, and really one of the world's greatest assets, go to such despair. And, and we were the brunt of the jokes on Johnny Carson, and, and you know, I, I sometimes like to credit him for, for getting this thing going. <laughs> um, but several friends groups started popping up around the park, and uh, there was a Central Park Community Fund which was run by Dick Gilder and George right. Soros. Mm -hmm. And Betsy Barlow Roger, who was the founder of the Conservancy, created the Central Park Task Force. Uh, and there was also a Friends of Central Park. And, and Gordon Davis, by 1979, became the Parks Commissioner. And Gordon was brilliant in his assessment. He goes, I better bring these strong groups together. Right. And, and so really was a merger of the Central Park Community Fund and the Central Park Task Force with Betsy Rogers in 1979 becoming the administrator of the park, and then in 1980 taking on that role of the president and CEO of the Central Park Conservancy. And it really is true that this was a combination of private interests, business interests, nonprofit organizations, government played an, a, an incredible role. It was very much of this sort of uniquely American practice of taking the individual on the one hand and the collective uh, elements of society, whether it's government, collective nonprofits, collective businesses, corporations, and, and creating out of that a, a series of responses, taking the strengths from each of the individuals or groups uh, that, that each had to, to contribute. Yeah, and I think that was the brilliance of it, and I think that's why I think Gordon deserves an incredible amount of credit because as as being a public city official, being able to step back and actually mm -hmm. saying, hey, we need help here. We're, you know, we're not going to be able to do this on our own. And, and I think it was a good time in the history of the city because I think m the major corporations knew if they were going to retain the best and the brightest and get people to move into New York City, which was crucial to help New York City in general just mm -hmm. get out of the fiscal crisis, uh, they needed to support having a great park. Uh, so families would want to come back into New York City. So in our early years, it was really a, a real focus on great corporate support. But, you know, it was, it was just amazing in the early days because the city really was always, and they still are, they set the policy for the park. Right. We just run the park for the city on an everyday basis. Um, but it was crucial in the early days to really rely on the city more than the conservancy because we were a young, fledgling organization. So really those early capital projects were funded by the city. Um, you know, what we were doing at that time, which was interesting, is we were kind of leveraging our support to help the city. And, and when I say that, it was like we were funding design projects. Mm -hmm. So we had literally, you know, shovel in the ground ready projects to go. Right. And, you know, the financing then in the city was a little different. So at the end of the fiscal year, if there was money left over, the city was actually looking for projects to do. And so we were able to kind of leverage that 
money and really start doing projects throughout Central Park. Talk a little bit about how you manage the park as a natural environment within a city and, and also recognizing some of the constraints of a natural environment that is cut off from the outside world. It, it actually exists within the sphere of itself. Yeah, it, there's solid walls around the park, so it's very interesting. But, you know, we really have to go back 160 years and really give credit to Frederick Olmsted and Calvert Fox, who were the creators and designers of Central Park. You know, you know think about it. Uh, when the park was created, most of New York City lived below 23rd Street. So the park was created to be this respite, this place, this democracy where people can go. They couldn't afford to go up to the Catskills or the Adirondacks, but it was for the everyday New Yorker to be able to feel that, that they went to the Adirondacks. But it was also designed and built to be an economic engine. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting because New York City was not really competing wonderfully with the other cities in the world. It was a very unhealthy city. You know, everybody had their individual wells that were all pretty much contaminated. Um, and so the two things that kind of happened during the same period of time, you know, fresh drinking water came to New York City, and then shortly thereafter came Central Park. And immediately the city started exploding up around this, uh, this Central Park. And, but think about the park was just kind of a, a, a wasteland of no trees, very little vegetation, uh, marshy and dirty areas. And Olmsted and Vox have this brilliance of wanting to create something that was so incredibly natural, but man-made. Right. And, and they only thought you hit excellence when people would walk in and say, my God, God did a great job here. And mm -hmm. that's what their goal was to do, and they did it better than anybody. And, you know, fast forward, what we have to do today is to keep that environment in good shape is a real challenge. And we have over 100 acres of woodlands in Central Park, which we're doing major work in right now. And it's... You know, how do you come up with management strategies so people don't trample through the woods? How do you come up with management strategies that there's no litter in these areas? And we've actually perfected the art of kind of carry in, carry out uh, as much as we possibly can. We're taking more and more trash cans out of the landscapes and moving them as far as we can to the perimeter. You know, one of the things about the ecosystem and seeing the ecosystem getting stronger is the fact that, you know, we never had chipmunks in Central Park. And now they're actually back in our woodlands. And, and one of the reasons we see that that's happening is because by taking the trash out of the woodlands, you're actually killing off the rat population, right. which is a competitor for food. And so now, without the competition, the chipmunks are back. So let's describe the physical layout of, uh, of the park. Give us a, a sense of how many acres, uh, the dimensions of the park, um, the extent of the park, north, south, east, west. Well, the park is 843 acres. It's a half mile wide by two and a half miles long. It goes from 59th Street to 110th Street. Uh, the actual original park actually went to only 106th Street, but while they were in construction, they realized that they were able to gobble up a few more blocks and actually extend the park to 110th Street. Um, so, and the park is made up of three different landscapes, really. You have your woodland landscape, you have your meadows, and you have your formal landscapes. And, and most of the park is really very, very informal. Uh, but Calvert Vox, who was the designer of the park, was concerned that people wouldn't want to come all the way up to Central Park because it was so far away from downtown that he created this very, very formal area called the Mall that a lot of people know to as today's literary walk. Mm -hmm. And then Bethesda Terrace, which is right. this really grand sandstone phenomenal facility that he said that people are going to want to come see this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's great that he did it, but I think people would have come anyway. <laughs> but, you know, people came on Sundays mostly. They came dressed in their very best. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's the place to be seen and people watch. And, and really, it's the, the use of the park has really changed so very little over 160 years. And, and that's really why people come use it again today. You know, we have over 250 acres of, of lawns in the park, 100 acres of woodlands. Um, so there's, in, you know, basketball courts, baseball fields, tennis courts, uh, you know, there's something for everybody. Talk a little bit about how you interact with others who are also citizens of the park and, and, uh, and advocates for the park. You know, there's, there's, it, it's about partnerships and you have to get along and work well with your partners. And, and I, you know, the first thing that I get asked when people come to visit us from around the country and around mm -hmm. the world, well, we want to start a conservancy 
but the Parks Department or some other agencies not doing what they should be doing, you know, what do we do? You, you got to get along with them. You got to work with them. So everybody's pointing fingers so often in these situations. And, 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 and it kind of gets to be a stalemate. And, and, and it, it takes years to get things moving. So, you know, the, the New York Roadrunners Club and Mary Wittenberg, you know, we've been, you know, close friends for years. You, you, you work together. You know, they're there to bring good use to the park. Um, if they're doing something that you don't quite like, you, you got to work with them and talk to them. The public theater is another great institution. Every week we have runs, we have walkathons, we have things going on in the park. You know, we have to work with all those components. You know, and I don't look at any of them as competition for, for donor dollars. I really don't. And, and that's why we like working with other institutions and other partnerships because, you know, the people that live around Central Park support Central Park. And, and they support it in a way that it's a really great investment. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's the one institution that I can tell you that I can almost guarantee you if you give us money, you're getting more money in return for that because look at what happens to the real estate values around the park. It's, it, it's, it's, it's made the real estate really doesn't make sense how much some of this real estate is because of Central Park. Um, so there's very little competition for that kind of donor dollars. And your budget is? Uh, $58 million a year. We raise 75% of that. The vast majority of that is from people that live around the park. It's individual donors. Uh, we have still some wonderful, incredible and corporate support, uh, institutional support, foundation support. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's about the individual citizens that use the park and, and, and come in the park every day and love the park, and they need to get involved. Our biggest challenge, though, is people still don't really recognize the Central Park Conservancy because it's, it's, right. it's still very strange anomaly. They think it's the Parks Department or, or there is a concern. So you have a branding issue that, that, that is ongoing. branding issue, yeah. And that, that's, you know, that was a challenge in the past because, you know, there was a period of time where you know, we've always had great relationships with our parks partners, but there was a period of time that it was nice for the Parks Department to kind of take the credit for bringing back Central Park. And, uh, there, you know, during most of the 90s, we couldn't even put Conservancy on our uniforms or on our vehicles. Um, and then under the Bloomberg administrator, we, we really talked about this issue of branding. Right. And that, you know, it's very difficult to co-brand sometime. We are partners with the city of New York, but when you have two logos always sitting next to each other, people get confused. So, you know, we've you know, pushed it a little bit to the limit, but we're always going to be respecting the fact that it's the city's park. Parks Department really is our boss. You know, as the administrator of the park, I report to the Parks Commissioner. Mm -hmm. uh, but as the president of the Conservancy, I report to our board of trustees. When you raise funds for a capital project, do you do it in coalition? Because no matter what your capital project might be, whether it's um, an area that runners use or an area uh, where dog wa that dog walkers use, um, whether it's a performance space, there are going to be different interests. The interests are not going to all be general interests. They, they, they will be specific. Do you create coalitions around those capital projects when you're raising funds for, for that type of? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're looking at right now, it's interesting, we have two major uh, projects going on in the park, big capital campaigns. And we have 21 playgrounds in the park. And so we, you know, we've restored every playground over the last 30 years. And now we're really going back and doing every one again. Uh, we want to make them more sustainable. We want to make them more accessible. We want to make them a lot more fun. We want to integrate them into the landscape better. Um, but, you know, you have an incredible community of people that use playgrounds. I mean, you've got about three to four million children a year going to Central Park Playgrounds. Yeah, even some of us 55-year-old, uh, 56-year-old <laughs> adults use playgrounds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's quite a community there that we deal with. Um, but we do all the design in-house. We do all the landscape management in-house. So, you know, we really put together a whole package and then we need to go out and sell it to the communities that really use these areas. Whatever you do, you always need to know you're moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something crucial that we always have to do because you can get stymied. You can get a setback. There are a lot of people that have a lot of feelings about Central Park. At the end of the day, that's a good thing. You know, we have five community boards that sit on the park. Right. You know, in the very early days, we would just go to the one community board in the community of that playground or that landscape. And then we realized pretty quickly that, you know, everybody looks at Central Park as their park. Right. So now we actually go to all five community boards. Um, and plus we go to all the other advisory boards around Central Park, which there's quite a few of them. So the public approval process 
or I'd like to say more, the outreach that we do when we do a capital project is quite as extensive. I mean, that, you can easily go a whole year going through this process. And this is after we've done a preliminary design, you go through the process, then you do a final design, and then you go through the process again. And what what does your staff cadre look like? And of course, you have a lot of volunteers as well. So talk about how your staff breaks down and what kind of uh, roles uh, you have as part of the Conservancy. We now have about 350 full-time Conservancy employees. When I started there in 1985, we had about 40. Uh, so the, the Conservancy has grown dramatically. About 220 of those are actually people working in the field. And, and those are the folks out there from picking up the litter every day to mowing the lawn, the pruning the trees, to making sure that every monument in the park is cleaned and waxed and, and bronzed every year. So you have different specialists. You have horticulturalists, you have um, people who uh, simply contribute their, their manual labor, you have people who are specialists in preservation of, of, uh, of sculptural artworks. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a cadre of different skills that you have to bring under one roof. Yeah, it's, a, it's like curating an incredible museum. Mm -hmm. You know, the, if you look at the beautiful rustic structures in the park, right. we do those in-house. Our, our staff historic learn restorations. those skills. Historic restorations. You know, every one of the monuments, every year, we have a beautiful crew that, that works full-time, and then in the summer we actually bring in a group of about five interns mm -hmm. uh, that are usually fine art students or, or conservationists, and they work alongside of our team making sure every monument in the park gets cleaned and protected. Uh, so there's a real variety of programs that people can do in Central Park. Um, you know, we could not do it without volunteers. We have about 350 people that volunteer significantly in the park, and then through a course of a year, we. We have about 1,000 people that go through our volunteer programs. Last year, we had about 52,000 hours wow. of volunteer work. And so, you know, we, we absolutely could not do it without the volunteers. We manage the park in a very interesting fashion that we, we call it zone management. And this is something that we instituted in 1995. And it's bringing a real accountable management system into the park. You know, when Betsy Barla Roger became the first administrator, that was bringing an accountable person managing the park. Prior to that, there was Nobody knew who was really responsible for Central Park, and that was one of the biggest issues. You know, people don't realize that back in 1980, when the park was in horrible shape, that they still had almost 300 employees working there. Not quite sure what they did, but they did have quite a few employees. And with that comes accountability. It comes met. Uh, you're able to now impose metrics. You're able to tie those metrics back to uh, to individuals, individual budgets for individual specific budgets. areas of the park. I can go out in the park and, and walk through the park and I can tell you immediately that someone is doing really good work in their area or where is somebody maybe falling short and let's figure out what they need and what resources because every zone gardener in their area is responsible for everything. You know, not necessarily I'm going to ask you to go climb to the top of a tree and prune it, but you're responsible if you see a branch that's broken to notify the appropriate people so that they will come and do it. So w one of the things that, that um, it's important for everyone to understand is that this type of a role is as complex and indeed in many respects far more complex than managing a whole series of real estate holdings within a, a particular uh, urban environment. You have to be flexible, you know, you have to listen to people, you have to not say no immediately and let's, let's carry this through. Maybe but also not be a pushover. And not be a pushover because, you know, at the end of the day what we're doing is making sure that we're protecting the park today and for future generations and protecting the legacy of Olmsted and Vaux, which, you know, you look at a lot of other parks throughout this country and people do not protect their legacy and those parks have disappeared. Right. And these are two of the most prolific landscape architects and there's just very few of their parks existing and people are finally starting to realize the significance of, of what Olmsted and Vaux did. Doug Blonsky, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us and thank you so much for your insights. Oh, it's a privilege to be here with you today. Thank you.